Lesson 8.4, The Law of Exponential Growth and Decay. In this lesson, we're going to look at some applications of exponential growth and decay. Let's start by looking at an example of exponential growth. Consider a small lake uh, that is exactly 100 acres in size. Now consider a lily pad, which is exactly one square foot in size. Now you may think of lily pads as those stereotypical things that sit on top of ponds that frogs jump from one end to the other end of the pond using, but they're actually quite dangerous to the ecosystem of the pond. For one, they block out light so that any vegetation growing at the uh, bottom of the uh, lake or pond uh, doesn't get enough light in order to grow, and that vegetation doesn't have the opportunity to perform photosynthesis, which oxygenates the water. So if you get too many lily pads on the surface of a lake or a pond, it can actually kill the ecosystem of the lake. So let's see if we can kill this lake. Consider if we add one lily pad per day. How long would it take to cover the entire lake? Well, 100 acres, which is about 43,000 square feet, at one lily pad per day is going to take about 4.3 million days which comes out to roughly 12,000 years. So unless you plan on living that long, it's going to take a while to kill this lake. But that's if we add just one lily pad per day. Now consider the other option that we just add one lily pad on the first day and we let it reproduce on its own. Let's say it reproduces at a rate of doubling each day. So one lily pad becomes two lily pads, becomes four lily pads, and so on. How long would that take to kill the lake? Well, let's see. On day one, there's exactly one lily pad on this lake. Now, of course, you can't see the lily pad because if this is a 100-acre lake uh, and we're hovering way over the lake in order to be able to see the whole thing, you're not going to be able to see one small square foot of lake covered up by a lily pad. It's going to take a while before we start seeing it from this theoretical height. So on day one, we have one lily pad. Day two, there are two lily pads on the lake. Day three, there are four. Day four, there would be eight. On day five, it'll double again. Day six, double again. Day seven, it'll double again. Day eight, day nine, day 10. And hopefully you've started seeing that uh, a group of lily pads growing in the top left-hand corner. Day 11, we double again. Now let's pause here for just a moment and look at that lily pad that I have there. Now, uh, I don't have the manpower to animate each individual lily pad that I'm going to put on top of this lake. So let's just say that lily pad right there represents what is now over a thousand lily pads. We started with one lily pad on day one, and then we doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled. By day 11, we actually have 1,024 lily pads. Feel free to test it on your own. If we start with one and double it 10 times, you're going to have 1,024. So that little lily pad right there represents over a thousand lily pads. And it took us 11 days to get there. Now let's pause here for just a moment and I want you to think to yourself, how long is it going to take to cover this entire lake? Recall that when we were adding one lily pad per day, it was going to take about 12,000 years to cover the entire lake. So take a moment right now, write down your prediction on how long it's going to take to cover this entire lake at the rate that we're now going. So let's continue on our merry way. Again, that one little lily pad represents over a thousand lily pads. Now I have two of those, so actually over 2,000 lily pads on day 12, day 13, day 14, doubling again, day 15, day 16, day 17. We're starting to get a little clump right here. Let's see how long it still takes to cover the entire lake. Still not, not a lot of the lake covered, so it may still take a while. Day 18, day 19, doubling again for day 20, doubling, doubling, doubling. We're up to 23 days. We've covered half the lake. How long is it going to take to cover the whole lake? Well, just one more day because we're doubling. So 24 days was the correct answer. Now, take a look at your prediction. How close were you to 24? That's quite a bit quicker than about 4 million days that it was going to take if we were covering it one at a time. When we're doubling, we have what's called exponential growth. Instead of increasing at the same rate every day, as you have more lily pads, it increases at a faster and faster rate. Consider that on day 17, we actually had less than 1% of the lake being covered. It took almost three weeks of growth 
before we barely had 1% of the lake being covered. And yet seven days later, one week later, the entire lake was covered. It took almost three weeks to cover barely none of the lake, and then just one more week to cover the entire lake. That's the power of exponential growth. It seems like it's not growing at all for a very long time, and then all of a sudden, it just explodes in growth. Now, if we take a quick moment to look at that growth in a slightly different way, instead of this visual representation, just a numerical representation, here's a chart that represents the first 11 days of growth. On the left, I have the specific day number, and on the right, I have the number of lily pads. Now, if I look at the number of lily pads each day, I can see that each day it's doubling in size, 8 to 16, 16 to 32, 32 to 64, and so on. Notice day 11, that's the place where we stopped earlier at 1,024, so if you didn't believe me before, here's the data to support my argument. And what I can actually do is develop an equation to describe all of this data all at once. Now we're not gonna go through the process just yet of how to build that equation, but I'm just gonna show you what it would be. In this case, it would be y equals two raised to the x minus one. Notice we have an exponential function, which is why we call this exponential growth. Pick any day, for instance, day number six. If I take six and plug it in for x, x minus one is five, two to the fifth is 32. I can use this equation, or when we're talking about application problems, we refer to it as a model, we can use this model to predict how many lily pads we're going to have on any given day. So if I want to know how many lily pads there will be on day 15, I can just plug in 15 in for x. 15 minus 1 is 14. 2 to the 14th will end up being a little over 16,000. So without having to wait for the lily pads to actually grow, once I've established a pattern, of exponential growth, I can use a model to predict what's going to happen in the future. Now, once I know something is growing exponentially, I can use something called the law of exponential growth and decay to build that model. And I know something is growing exponentially if the rate of growth is proportional to the current size. Consider with the lily pads, when I had a small number of lily pads, one, two, four, eight, I wasn't increasing by that much each day. Day one to day two increased by one. Day two to day three increased by two. That's not really increasing by much. But when I had a thousand lily pads, my increase from day 11 to day 12 went from 1,000 to over 2,000. Because I had more lily pads to start with, it was able to grow that much quicker. The rate of growth is proportional to the current size. Now in calculus, we'll describe that statement using this mathematical equation. You don't need to know anything about this uh, equation. I'm just putting it here to illustrate something. Uh, for instance, uh, the rate of growth, that's what this doodad right here actually represents. You'll learn all about that in calculus. The word is is equals. And then proportional to the current size, proportional to the current size, well the current size is y, and then if we multiply y times some constant k, some constant of proportionality, that's uh, to say that it's proportional to the current size. Again, you don't need to know about this particular equation. I just want to show you the actual rule that we're going to use. We're not going to use this calculus formula. We're going to do some calculus, 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 until we get to this formula right here, y equals ce to the kt. The actual law of exponential growth and decay is this guy right here, but we're not ready for that guy yet take calculus to be ready for that guy. So we're just going to use the simplified version of the law of an ex exponential growth and decay, this formula right here. Y equals CE to the KT. When something is growing exponentially, you can start with the formula Y equals CE to the KT, where Y represents the amount at any given time T. C is going to represent the initial amount. K is the growth or decay rate. If uh, K is positive, then it's growing. If K is negative, then it's decaying. And T is the time. And of course, E is Euler's number, the natural constant, 2.718. Remember, back in a previous lesson, I told you that the number E shows up all the time when we're talking about exponential growth. Well, it's actually a big part of the actual law of exponential growth. So every time we're looking at an example involving exponential growth and decay, we're going to use this formula, y equals ce to the kt, to find whatever it is that we're looking for. Common applications of exponential growth and decay would be interest. Again, recall we talked about uh, the compound interest formula. Uh, that's an example of exponential growth. Population, here is a uh, graph of the uh, 
world population over the last 2,000 years or so. Uh, notice that for the longest time, it doesn't really seem to be growing that fast. It's just kind of level for years and years and years and years. And then sometime around the 15, 16, 1700s, it starts to shoot up. And then after the 1900s, boom, it just explodes. Here's a basic example of what a graph of an exponential function looks like. It's level for years and years and years, and that just explodes all at once. Radioactive decay, we're going to actually look at a couple examples of those later on. A nuclear chain reaction. Uh, here's a, a quick diagram of a nuclear chain reaction. What actually happens in a nuclear chain reaction is you shoot a uh, lone neutron into an atom. Uh, in this case we have an atom of uranium-235. That's a particular isotope of uranium. When you shoot that neutron into the uranium, it actually splits that uranium into two smaller atoms. Now when you break that into two smaller atoms, it actually sends off some other stray neutrons that hit some other uranium atoms that they themselves split up that send off more new, uh, random stray neutrons which split even more uranium atoms and it just chain reactions splitting more and more uranium atoms faster and faster and faster. Now if you uh, uh, control that uh, reaction time of how fast it's splitting the atoms you can actually create uh, and generate heat. You can use that heat to boil water and you boil that when you boil that water that creates steam and that steam can spin a turbine and when you spin that turbine you create energy. That's how a nuclear power plant works. If you don't control that reaction and it grows beyond your control that's what we call a nuclear weapon. Congratulations you now how, know how to make a nuclear weapon. Temperature is another example of exponential growth and decay. Computer processing power, something known as Moore's Law. Uh, Moore's Law basically says that uh, computer processing increases in speed over time. It actually increases such that every 18 months or so, processors actually become twice as fast. So if you buy a processor, a computer processor today, uh, wait about a year and a half to two years, uh, that computer will be half as fast as the uh, modern computers. Another example of exponential growth and decay would be the spread of a disease. The more people who are sick, the more people they can infect, and the faster that disease will spread through a population. Now, let's go ahead and take a quick moment and look at that one as an example uh, in order to build a model. Now, what mathematicians actually do, what a mathematician is a tool for, is building models. As a mathematician, I take data from the world around me, and I build an equation or a model that can be used to predict what's going to happen in the future or to determine what happened in the past. The better that model fits the given data, the more predictive power that model is going to have. So let's practice here. There are five people who have contracted a highly contagious virus. Based on the incubation period of the virus and the social activities of the infected individuals, the infected population doubles every three days. Now because we're talking about the spread of a disease, I can use a formula as the base of my model, specifically the law of exponential growth and decay, y equals ce to the kt. I'm going to use this as the base of my model and I'm going to take the given data, plug it into my formula to create a unique model for the given situation. Now recall what I told you earlier, C represents the initial condition and K represents either the growth or the decay rate. In this case, I started with five people, but then it's doubling every three days. So we're going to be growing, so I expect the K value to be positive. Y and T represent the output and input of my model. T is the time and Y is the amount that I have at time T. So Y and T are going to remain as variables throughout this process. What I need to do is figure out what C and K are because those are constants. I can plug numbers in to fill in those spots. Just like if I have an equation of a line, Y equals MX plus B, M and B are constants, Y and X are the variables. So we're going to look at the given situation to pull out some data. Let's start with there are five people who have contracted the virus. So at time zero, Y equals five. Zero would be the T value and five would be the Y value. Now recall that I've already told you that C represents the initial condition, so we could just go ahead and take the 5 as the initial value and plug it in for C, but I want to take a moment to prove it to you. So if T is 0 and Y is 5, plug in 5 for Y, 0 for T. Now immediately that 0 times K is going to disappear, 
and e to the 0 is 1, 1 times c is just c, so c equals 5. So anytime you're given an initial value, a starting point, that means that the t value is 0, and this whole piece, this whole piece right here, is always just going to disappear completely. So whatever the initial condition is, you can immediately just plug that in for c, because that's the value at time 0. So let's do that. There are five people who have contracted the virus, so y equals 5 e to the kt. Now I'm also told a secondary piece of information, that the population doubles every three days. So if I started with 5, after three days I'm going to have 10. We call that the secondary condition. This is my initial condition. And this is my secondary condition. My initial condition is used to find the C value, and then my secondary condition is used to find the K value. I'm going to take that secondary condition, T equals 3 and Y equals 10, and plug it back into the law of exponential growth and decay, keeping in mind that 5 is already plugged in for my C value. And let's solve for K. Now keep in mind, let's clean up that exponent. Instead of K times 3, I'm going to write 3K. Now notice, what I'm doing here is I'm solving for k. I'm solving for an exponent, which makes this an exponential equation. If this is an exponential equation, we'll use techniques that we learned in the last lesson, solving exponential equations. I have a single variable. I'm going to use isolation techniques. And I'm going to start from the outermost operation and strip away one layer at a time. Remember, I don't care about the side that doesn't have the variable on it. I'm just focusing on this side right here. The goal is to get k by itself, but the outermost operation is the 5. So I'm going to get rid of the 5, because that 5 is being multiplied, I'm going to get rid of the 5 by dividing both sides by 5. That gives me 2 equals e to the 3k. Again, the goal is to get k by itself. The outermost operation is e, which is the base of an exponential. Inverse of an exponential is a logarithm. I'm going to use a logarithm to get rid of e. Uh, as I told you last time, I'm going to use ln every single time. It just so happens that e and ln cancel each other out, so we're left with ln of 2 is equal to 3k. My goal is to solve for k. The only thing hanging out with the k is that multiplication by 3, so I'm going to divide both sides by 3. So now I have my k value, ln of 2 over 3. So this k value represents my growth factor. ln of 2 over 3 is a positive value because uh, 2 is greater than 1, and any logarithm of uh, a number greater than 1 is going to give me a positive number. ln of a number less than 1 is going to give me a negative value. Uh, since this is uh, greater than 1, ln of 2 over 3 is a positive value, which confirms that this is actually growing. If I had gotten a negative k value or ln of a proper fraction, which would produce a negative value, since I already knew that this problem is representing growth, I would know that I've made a mistake on the k value and I could stop here before I move forward. But here I have a positive value of k, so let's keep moving forward. Just like I did when I figured out c, now with the k value I'm going to go back and plug it back in. So what was y equals c e to the kt is now y equals 5 e raised to the ln of 2 over 3 times t. And this is what's referred to as a model. Again, just like y equals mx plus b, I found my two constant values, my m and my b, or in this case, my c and my k, and I now have an equation that models the given data. I can now use this equation to make predictions about how fast the uh, contagion is going to be spreading through the population. I can uh, use the model to figure out at what time a particular number of people were infected. Uh, I can figure out anything I need to know about this situation using this model. But I'm not quite happy yet. Now you may notice right here, the E and the LN. You may be thinking to yourself, hey, don't E and LN cancel out? And yes, they do. E and LN cancel out. In this case, E raised to the LN of X would just equal X. So can I just cancel the E and the LN? The problem is no. Because the ln of 2 is inside of a fraction, which itself is being multiplied by a secondary value, I can't just cancel the e and the ln. But what I can do is manipulate this uh, equation before I move forward. Given a statement that looks like this, keep in mind a little property of fractions. If I have a over b times c, that's the same thing as a times c over b. Notice what I did, the a and the c 
kind of stayed put. It was the division that switched places. Instead of dividing A by B, now I'm dividing C by B. Because of course, when I'm multiplying fractions, either way, this would end up being AC over B. They're the same thing. Multiplication and division are the same thing. They can be done in any order. Instead of dividing the A by B, I could just as easily divide the C by B. The way I'm going to apply that here is I'm going to recognize instead of saying ln of 2 over 3 times t, I could instead say ln of 2 times t over 3. It says exactly the same thing, but if you see, I'm kind of liberating that logarithm from the fraction. I'm getting it closer to be able, being able to cancel the e and the ln. I still can't cancel it as is because that ln of 2 is still being multiplied by the t over 3. The rule I had was about e being raised to the ln of x. It didn't say anything about e to the ln of x times something else. So I can't quite cancel the e and the ln until I recognize there's another property I can use here. That whole power to a power rule. When I have x to the a to the b, that's the same thing as x to the product of a and b. Power to a power is a product. So if I have a product in an exponent, I can actually break it into a power to a power. I have a product and an exponent, which means I could rewrite this expression. Instead of e to the ln of 2 times t over 3, I could do e to the ln of 2 raised to the t over 3. And now because I don't have this extra little multiplier, I can finally cancel the e and the ln. I can cancel the e and the ln, and that just leaves me with 2 as the base of the exponential. So instead of e to the ln of 2 over 3 times t, I now have 2 to the t over 3 with the 5 hanging out up front. Now the good news is you don't have to do any of this mess. If you want to, you can stop right here and call this your model and then use this model to make any predictions that I ask you to make. Or you can jump directly from here to here in one step. This is also a model. It just happens to be a prettier version of the model. I'm going to be using this prettier version every single time, but you're welcome to use this less pretty version. All right, Pretty version, not so pretty version. Either one will work. It doesn't matter which one you use. So just to reiterate, in general, if you have a model that looks like this, where you have the E and the LN still in there, you can just simplify it in one quick step by canceling the e and the ln and bringing the a down as your new base. All right. So if you have e to the ln of a over b, whatever that k value happens to be, you can cancel the e and the ln and bring the a downstairs, leaving the b and the t still in the exponent. So if I have y equals, let's say, uh, 4e to the ln of uh, 17 over 12 all over 4 times t. You can cancel out the e and the ln real quick and you're left with y equals 4 times it's going to be 17 over 12 because that's what was inside the logarithm raised to the t over 4 in one quick step without having to do all the work.